Well, go with me to James chapter 4 tonight as we continue our study in the general epistles. James chapter 4. Chapter 3, we start looking at the pitfalls of pride, and chapter 3 deals with the tongue and how our tongue can get us into more trouble than anything else, and uh, that pride ultimately uh, has a lot to do with the trouble we get ourselves into and mouthing off and things of that nature. But we come to chapter 4 tonight, and uh, we see a different pitfall of pride, and that's conflicts with brethren. And verse 1, it says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Uh, the, the words translated wars and fightings, they, they can have the sense of military conflict, but they have a more practical meaning to them, and it's a sense of arguing and daily personal conflict. You know, why, why, if you're the, if nobody can get along with you, it's not everybody else, probably. If you find that I just have trouble getting along with people, people just, you know, there's just a lot of messed up people, and I just can't find people to, that I can get along with. The problem isn't everybody else, okay? The problem's you. Whence cometh wars uh, and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? James is answering his own question, where do these wars and fightings come from? These external conflicts ultimately come from the internal conflict in each person, these lusts that are warring inside of us. And he's talking there about uh, desires. And he's talking about the selfish, carnal type of desires that uh, war in us. And we all have desires. We all want things. Some people are more uh, more attracted to, you know, maybe financial or material uh, things that they want. Others may be more attracted to, uh, to indulging in food and drink or maybe uh, others indulging in other vices along the way. Things that, that held in their proper God-given purpose aren't a bad thing, but these desires, these lusts that are inside of us and warring in our members, and uh, when we don't learn to control our desires, then what happens is that those desires become, uh, they, they, be, they cause the conflict. Again, it's, it's pride. I want something, therefore I feel entitled to it, and anybody who doesn't give that to me, it, standing in the way of what I want has to be run over has to be knocked down a peg, has to be dealt with in some way. Uh, and that's ultimately where a lot of these issues stem from. Uh, in Proverbs 13.10, the Bible says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. You cannot have contention without pride being involved. Whether it's contention at work, or it's contention in your marriage, or it's contention at home with your uh, kids or kids with their parents or uh, just uh, at church or anything like that, you can't have contention without pride being involved in some way. Um, now, some people are peacemakers and some people are contention makers. They're, they're pot stirrers. Um, and people who are contentious are proud. That's what the scripture says. They're, the root problem is not their personality disorder. The root problem is they're proud. Uh, and when they learn that they're not the most important person in the world, they won't be so contentious. And one of the scariest things for me right now as, 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 a, as a pastor and as, a, uh, as an American, just uh, you know, getting to that point where grandchildren will be on the way, and I think about my, uh, the world my grandchildren are growing up into, the, the generation that's coming up has been so, so indulged they're even the most ridiculous and absurd ideas and desires that they have have been indulged by adults. And we are creating a neurotic society. The quickest way to have a neuroses is to focus on yourself. You're, you're neurotic, you're narcissistic if you focus on yourself all the time. Depression, anxiety, all these things are a result of self-focus. I'm looking, I'm navel-gazing. Uh, and our society today, you know, you hear this all the time. Uh, in fact, I saw somebody at the, when I was working the polls, you know, they wear, wore a shirt, said, we need to talk about mental health, um, you know, we need to have a conversation about mental health. And, and no, we need to have fewer conversations about that. What we need to start doing is stop focusing on ourselves and start focusing on the needs of others. We focus on our wants, then we become a self-centered loser. And when we focus on the needs of others, we become productive. 
And what we've done is trained everybody, how you feel is the most important thing. In fact, how you feel is your identity. How you feel is who you are. And we know from Scripture that that is exactly 180 degrees out of phase from the truth. That's exactly the opposite of the, what the truth is. Your feelings will be wrong 98% of the time. You will feel a certain way, and there will be no logical, evidence-based reason for that feeling. We don't really control how we feel. We, we might feel sad, and there's no reason to feel sad. We might feel angry, and we really shouldn't feel angry. Uh, we might feel depressed, and there's no reason to feel depressed. Our feelings will betray us all the time. We are not supposed to live our life based on how we feel. Because how we feel and objective truth are two entirely... Our feelings are subjective, truth is objective, and we want to live with objective truth, not subjective feelings. And so people who are guided by their feelings, this is what they do. And they're, they're constantly, uh, you know, they're up, they're down, they're, they're constantly swept away with whatever the situation is in the moment. And they're overwhelmed in, in their feelings. And it, it's, it's our lusts and desires in our members. It's, it's the things that I want uh, that ultimately are the result, they result in the wars and the fightings or the, the arguing, the personal daily conflict. Because I want what I want, and I'm not focused on the needs of others around me. Uh, and so I become argumentative. I become aggravated. Um, uh, as I've said many times, anger is the result of unmet expectations. It's very simple. Ang you, you have expectations. They're not met. Anger is the result. Everybody gets angry when their expectations are not met. Everybody does. The question is, are your expectations reasonable or unreasonable? If you expect your spouse to read your mind, that's an unreasonable expectation. Don't be angry with your spouse when they fail to read your mind. If you want them to know what you're thinking, you have to communicate at the highest form of human communication, through language. We're not drawing hieroglyphics. We're not drawing in the dirt. We're, we just go to them and we tell them. Uh, what we want them to know, and then we can expect them and hold them accountable for that. And so uh, pride is what results in contention, the selfishness uh, that people tend to have. And uh, several of the words that are used in, in verse 2, he says, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. Uh, there's a lot of words here, these four words used in verse 2 that are the fruit of the carnal nature. Uh, these lusts, these uncontrolled desires that we have, killing, uh, fighting, war, these, this is what flows from selfishness. This is what flows from me firstism. And, and the Lord taught us and the scripture teaches us that we should first put, put God first in our lives, seek first the kingdom of God, he should be first in our lives. He tells us that we should serve others. And he says, don't worry about loving yourself. Everybody loves themselves. That's what Ephesians 5 says. No man yet ever hated him, his flesh, loved it, nourished it. How do I know you don't hate yourself? You fed yourself today. You clothed yourself. You showered. You, most of you, made yourself relatively well, you know. That's how I know you love yourself. We all love ourselves. We care. We, we want to look presentable when we walk out the door. We want, you know, we don't, we look in the mirror. We make sure we've gotten everything, you know. Mm. Yep, okay. We sit down and we eat. Some of us eat three times a day. Some of us maybe indulge a little bit more. You know who you are. Some of us eat ice cream too often. I know who I am. We already love ourselves, but when, when that becomes our purpose, and when, when loving ourselves goes beyond just taking care of ourselves so that we can, we can function, um, you know, and taking showers and eating when we're supposed to and putting on clothes and combing our hair and brushing our teeth and 
you know, doing those things. When it goes beyond that to say, every want and desire that I have in life, somebody, I expect somebody to meet that. I expect somebody to give me. Then what you have is a disaster in the making. You have the pathway to zero fulfilling relationships in your life. Marriage is not based on me getting what I want. It's about me meeting the needs of my spouse. And if both spouses put the, their spouse first, well, put the Lord first, but you know what I mean. Put them ahead of myself, if I could put it that way. If I put my wife's needs ahead of my needs, and my wife puts my needs ahead of her needs, guess what? Everybody gets their needs met. But when I say, I want my needs met, I'm not focused on meeting my spouse's needs, so why would they meet mine? I'm, I'm just sitting around waiting for somebody to serve me. And Jesus said, I didn't even come to be served. I came to serve, not to be served. And the greatest among you, Jesus said, let him be your minister. Let him be your servant. Let him be the one who puts the needs of others ahead of themselves. I will take care of you by, by serving the Lord, putting his will first by serving our brothers and sisters in Christ, by meeting the needs of our spouse, by putting other people ahead of our wants and desires, what we end up with is putting ourselves in the hand of God to, and letting Him meet our needs. And he, he always makes sure that our needs get met. It's only when we are, we're standing up for our rights um, in, in a selfish kind of a way that we, we are doomed to failed relationships. We're doomed to wars and fightings and striving. You cannot have two people who are submitted to the will of God, who are trying to serve other people, fighting with one another. You can't have it. You only have that when somebody says, well, I want my way, and I'm not going to give up until I get my way. The other person will say, well, we're not, you're not going to get your way, and then there's, there's fighting. All of these are the fruit of, of this selfish uncontrolled, I want, give me, give me, give me. It's one of the things that we work very hard with our kids about growing up. Every kid says to their parent, I want. And when we didn't ask them what they want, our reply was usually, I don't care. Oh, that hurts their feelings. Again, I don't care. They're, they'll get over their feelings. What they need to learn is what they want in the moment is not the most important thing to anybody but them. And nobody, because they said the magic words, I want, nobody is getting up to do anything about it. And if you've met my kids, you know that they're normal, well-adjusted people who both feel the call of God to go into ministry and serve the Lord because we didn't indulge their wants. You're not going to get what you want in ministry. I know there are some real morons out there think, well, I want to be in charge so I can get what I want all the time. Like, you have no idea what it means to be a pastor, do you? Being a pastor is not about getting what you want. It's about figuring out what the Lord wants and trying to get that implemented in your church. I don't get what I want either. If I had my way, I'd get paid a lot more. But, you know, I don't get... You know, my, I want $150,000 a year and a brand new Cadillac every other year, but you won't give it to me. So I, I just don't. I say that jokingly, but there are a lot of men who think that they're called into ministry who that's what they make their decisions based on is, well, I want two days off and I want this much vacation and I want this, and if you can't give it to me, then I'm not interested. And to that I say, get out of the ministry, you dope. You won't survive 10 minutes of real ministry with that attitude. Where does God want you? Go there, and whatever they pay you, God will make it work. That's called faith. You're going to need some of that faith when you're in ministry. Because let me tell you something. Nobody's going to line up to meet your need when you're in, in ministry. Occasionally, God sends people that, that blesses you and things like that. But folks don't come to church and say, how can I meet pastor's needs today? That thought never crossed anyone's mind till I just said it. And you'll have forgotten it by the time you get in your car tonight and go home. But that's fine. I'm the shepherd, you're the sheep. I'm, I'm the one supposed to be meeting your needs. 
You meet my needs by showing up and implementing the things I preach. That's, that rejuvenates me right there. So James finishes the thought by telling them at the end of verse 2, you have not because you ask not. Just simply failing to ask God for the things that you want. Now, who does this remind us of? Not asking for the things that they want and need. Well, I don't know. Let's go back to the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And for 40 years, the nation of Israel marched around in the desert because of their own stinking disobedience. They marched around in the desert, and when they didn't have water, when the water was poisoned and they couldn't drink the water, they said, Moses, would you plead with God to give us those things which we need? We are relying upon the power of God now, and we, we think that we know that God did not bring us out here in the wilderness to let us die of thirst. Anybody read that in their Bible? You got the wrong version of the Bible. They said was, you brought us out here to die. Were there not enough graves in Egypt? And, the... and then when they, they wanted food, and you know, there weren't very many Walmarts out in the wilderness, so it wasn't like they could go grocery shopping. And when they needed food, they said, Moses, you know, we, we need some food. Would you ask God to send us some food? We, we, we will just wait because we know God's going to provide, and this is going to be awesome. We can't wait to see how God provides food for us in the wilderness. Did they say that? No. They said, were there not enough graves in Egypt? You brought us out here to die. And, and this happens over and 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 over again. It happens so many times that on at least two occasions, if not three, God says, that's it, I'm going to wipe them all out. I can't take their complaining anymore. Moses says, no, 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 don't do that. And they do it so often that at least one time, Moses goes to the Lord and says, wipe them all out, I can't take them anymore. And the Lord says, no, I'm not going to do that. And that God sent fiery serpents among them to punish them. And God did other, brought other plagues upon them because they constantly murmured and they complained. They complained about the way they were going, the food they had, the water. What enough water? There wasn't enough this. What enough that? It's too hard. We don't like it. What, what's the point of, of being out here? And they complained and they complained and they complained whenever they had a desire that they felt was going unfulfilled. And never one time in Scripture do you read that the nation of Israel said, would God, would you just provide what we need? Do you think God would not have provided them the manna if they had asked for it? Maybe they would have gotten something even better than manna. Maybe every day they would have had a different flavor of manna instead of just one flavor for 40 years. They complained. They said, back in Egypt, we had the leeks and the melons and the garlic and all this stuff. All we have out here is this manna, uh, and we, we don't like it, and it, we're tired of this, and we want some variety in our diet. If they had asked God for the variety that they desired, do you think God would have said, no, just shut up and eat the manna? No, he probably would have rained some cucumbers and some melons and some leeks and some garlic on them. But they never asked. They never asked. They didn't ask for water. They didn't ask for food. They didn't ask for a better way. They didn't ask for anything. They just complained. You know why? Because they were focused on themselves the whole trip. I want. I don't think. I don't like. When are we going to get there? And God constantly and repeatedly pushed them back. In Psalm 37, 4, the Bible says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the what? The desires of thine heart. If you, if you stop what the fighting and the killing and the warring and all of that stuff, does it get you anything? That's what James is really asking there. Uh, in verse 2, you lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not. What has all of your complaining and fussing and fighting and scratching and clawing have done to meet your needs and satisfy you? Has it done it? No. Why don't you just ask God? Why don't you just stop fighting, stop clawing, 
and say, Lord, this is what I would like. But not as I will, as you will. And in whatsoever state I am in, I will be content. How often do you think your prayers would be answered with that attitude? Not all the time. Even Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane wasn't answered the way he wanted. Let this cup pass for me. Father said, no. Paul, three times, prayed, take this thorn of the flesh out of me. And God said, no. God doesn't answer the way we want every time. But you know what? The answer was right every time. It was right for that cup not to pass from Jesus. It was right for Paul to have that thorn in the flesh. It made Paul weak so that God could be strong, and God used him more with the thorn than he would have without the thorn. And Jesus, if he hadn't died on the cross, we would be in some deep trouble. Had the Father said, yes, I will let that cup pass from you, we would be in terrible trouble tonight. God doesn't always answer the way we want, but he always answers right. And most of the time, we don't have what we want and don't have what we need because we don't bother to ask him. And we scratch and we claw and we fight and we get all bent out of shape and we have all these things. And yet, we just never think to go ask God for it. Reminds me of right after I started wearing glasses. I was about 13, started wearing glasses. And I, was, I, didn't, I didn't really have a strong prescription. I needed them to read. I needed them to you know, uh, do certain things. But I, I didn't really need them to navigate the house. I knew the house, and you know, not like I was totally blind without my glasses. So I was taking my glasses off and setting them down all the time. <clears throat> And I remember I, I had taken my glasses off and I had set them down somewhere and I went to try to find my glasses and I, I looked all over my room, they weren't there. I looked in my closet, they weren't there. I went upstairs in the kitchen, I looked through the kitchen, I, they weren't there. Went into the living room, looked through the living room, weren't there. Went into the den, weren't there. Went into the bathroom, both bathrooms at the house, they weren't in either of those bathrooms. You know, Mom, have you seen my glasses? No, I haven't seen your glasses. Dad, have you seen my glasses? No, I haven't seen your glasses. Joe, Jake, have you seen my glasses? No, I haven't seen your glasses. And I'm looking around, and I'm looking around, and like an hour and 45 minutes, I'm looking for my glasses. I can't find them. And then the Holy Spirit says, hey, I know where they are. Why don't you ask them? Oh. And so I, I went down into my room, and I said, Lord, would you show me where my glasses are? Oh, there they are right there. Before I finished asking the question, I found them. And just for fun, the Lord had them on my bed where I could sit on them when I went down to my room. Uh, those glasses were not sitting on my bed the whole time, it, it, unless the Lord just blinded my eyes to them, and pardon the pun there, but they weren't there. I would have seen them there. But they were there when I asked him, and I found them immediately. And I thought, why don't I learn to just ask? I wasted an hour and 45 minutes rooting around the house, and what did I get for it? Nothing. I still didn't know where my glasses were. As soon as I asked God where they were, I had them. It's just a little example, but it, that made an impression on me at 13 years old. We, we have not because we ask not. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart we stop being so selfish, if we stop letting those lusts and our desires rule us and govern us and dictate to us, uh, then we would be more inclined to ask, and we'd be more inclined to ask the way God wants us to ask, and then he will take care of our needs. But we can sometimes still be selfish and still ask. Verse 3, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Now, you don't have, you're fighting, clawing, scratching, warring, and you don't have because you don't ask. Okay, Lord, give it to me. And he says, no. Huh. You said ask. I'm asking. No. <clears throat> Why? Because you're asking for selfish things. Now, I believe this with all my heart. If I said, God, we need... $200,000 for our building fund. Would you just send us $200,000 this week? I believe God could do that. <clears throat> I don't believe he's going to, but I believe he could. If I went to him tonight and said, Lord, I have always wanted to hit a golf ball farther than Brad does. 
would you bless me with a driver better than his and more skill than he has so I can hit a golf ball farther than he can? It would be a miracle, I know, Bran. I believe God can do miracles, though. <clears throat> or if I said, you know, God, I, I really want this brand new car. Oh, I, you know, I would love to have this car. I, I'm not a brand new car kind of guy. I, 73 Firebird, you know, that's kind of my thought process right now. If I ever had, a, had a, the money to waste on a nice car, like I'd get one, restore it, drop in an engine way bigger than needed to be in there, and burn through tires like you wouldn't believe. That's what I would do. Eric, could God give me the car I want? Mm -hmm. He could have somebody show up with a car carrier, pull up and say, is there a Brian Dahlke Sr. here? <clears throat> I got a 73 Firebird I want to unload. Could God do that? Mm -hmm. Is he likely to? No, I, I don't want that Firebird for his glory. I want that for me and my personal happiness. And it would make me personally very happy. Ignore the circles of tire marks in the parking lot. That's just me testing out the car. <clears throat> you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, you may consume it upon your laws. The word translated consume there has the sense of wasting. It's the same word that's used in Luke chapter 15, verse 14, in the story of the prodigal son, where it says, And when he had spent all, when he had wasted everything that he had. Why do you want that? You want that so you can just waste it. You want that because you just have a selfish desire. You just, it, it's not for God's glory. It's not to serve other people. God's more likely to give us a 15-passenger van to go pe pick people up from church than he is to give us a sports car. That's just for our own personal satisfaction. So God's not interested in satisfying and indulging your lust because if God indulges your lust all the time, it's like if you're a parent in here, you know that the worst thing that you can do for your child is give them what they want because it... It only encourages their selfish, selfishness and the lusts and the desires inside of them. It only makes it grow. And they will be consumed and controlled by their lusts and desires later on in life. They will never know how to be disciplined and be able to accept the answer, no, you can't have what you want right now. And so the best thing that you can do for your kids is routinely not give them what they want. Give them what you want them to have when you want them to have it, and teach them. Life is not about getting what you want. You will not go anywhere in life where everybody will give you what you want. Getting married, your spouse will not give you everything that you want. I know people who get married and they think that will fulfill me, I'll have everything that I want. They find out that the person they married is not perfect and doesn't give them everything they want. So I say, well, what I need is, is children. I'll start having children and those children will give me what I want. Your children will not fulfill you in life. They will suck the life out of you until they leave, get married, and bring grandkids back to you. They only get more expensive and more dangerous the older they get. You know, uh, when you think Charlie and Franco and they're running around, you think about, uh, you know, especially them because they're boys and boys have less judgment and this, you know, the most dangerous words men ever utter is, hey, watch this. <laughs> Spreading the prelude to it, a ride to the emergency room in an ambulance more times than not. But, you know, these one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old boys that, you know, they run around and they don't realize sliding down headfirst on the stairs is not a smart thing to do, or throwing knives is not a smart thing to do, or having a cigarette lighter in your hand is not a smart thing. They don't understand those things. But let me tell you, when they get 10 years, 12 years, 15 years older, they're more dangerous because then they're like, hey, I want my driver's license like Josh does. He wants his driver's license. You haven't lived till you teach your kid how to drive. You will draw closer to the Lord than you have ever been in your lifetime.
There are dents in the floorboard on the passenger side of all of our cars where I've gone, slow down, stop, that's a red light. You should be on the brake already. But their, their desires, their costs, their, their predilection for danger only seems to get worse as they get older. Well, I'm going to go find a church, and that church is going to give me everything that I want. Well, not at this church. We didn't start, our, our philosophy of ministry here does not start with, what do people want? It starts with, what does Jesus want? It's his church. So I don't get what I want all the time. You don't get what you want all the time. We're equally disappointed. That's what makes it, it should give us common ground. But I'll tell you what, I won't complain about all the times I don't get what I want if you won't complain about the times you don't get what you want, and we'll call that a relationship. You know, we're supposed to love one another, yes, and we're supposed to look out for the needs of other people. But if you're the kind of person who just sits in the, in the chair and says, gimme, 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 uh, you're not much of a church member. Because you're also supposed to be looking out for the needs of the other people around you. Maybe you'd be fulfilled if you were giving of yourself rather than taking. Because it is more blessed to give than to what? Exactly. So... I love when God is calling in the middle of the service. He says, Ignacio, come. You must, you must repent now. Uh, I'm still getting used to that. I pastored out in the country where we didn't even have a cell tower close enough by to the last couple of years I was there. So the phones never went off in church because they didn't work. You go down a couple of miles, they'd work just fine over the hill. Oh, it's funny. I occasionally, somebody's phone will go off in church and I go check mine because I've forgotten a few times. It's just, uh, I know a pastor who heard a phone going off in church one time. He's like, whose phone is that? Turn that off. And his wife's like, um, honey, it's, it's yours. You left it on the chair. <laughs> that, that's why it doesn't bother me because it'll be mine one day. You have not because you ask not. And then you have not because you ask amiss. You ask foolishly. Look at verse 4. The adulterers and adulteresses. Well, wait a minute. Who's he talking to here? Is he talking to lost people? How's that? Your preacher gets up and says, you adulterers and adulteresses. That's what James says. He was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. You adulterers and adulteresses? Well, what makes them adulterers and adulteresses? Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know what the problem is here? We're talking about the pitfalls of pride. Our, our tongue, if, if pride gets a hold of us, our tongue is a definite pitfall to us. It's a net negative in our life if we're proud. But if we're proud, then we're, we're contentious and we fight and we, we want what we want and we're, we're self-centered and selfish and all of these things. But notice now he's, he's shifting what we generally want, what our, when our lusts are out of control, when our lusts are not in line with the Scripture, the things that we lust after are things that are in the world. They're not the things of God. I, I don't wake up in the morning and my flesh does not say, hey, uh, I really want to sit and spend an hour reading the Bible today. Let's do that. My flesh never does that. My flesh never says, hey, why don't, we, uh, why don't we go somewhere quiet and why don't we spend an hour praying and just, uh, just being alone with God. My flesh never says that. You know what my flesh says? Hey, I wonder if there's a football game on. 
my flesh says, uh, oh, uh, wonder what, what these people have to say. Oh, I, let me check my Facebook and see how many likes I got on my last post. My flesh says, you know what, I'm going to feed my face first instead of feeding my soul first. Now, I know some, some of you, you don't wake up for the first 45 minutes, you're actually on your feet. And so reading your Bible at that time is not productive time. Part of my wake-up routine is showering and eating. If I don't do those two things, I'm not terribly, it's not profitable time for me to read. But these are the things I want. And so when my... When my flesh desires things, it's always the things that are contrary to the Word of God. It's always the things that the world has to offer. It's the things that the world thinks are important. They become important to me. Because the world doesn't have the Spirit of Christ in them, so the only thing that they're controlled by is their lust, their selfish desires. And so when I'm not, when I'm not in line with the Bible... And I, I am governed and dictated by my carnal desires. I am just like the world, except that I'm married to Christ. And if I go back and fool around with the world, now I'm committing adultery. That's the difference. The world is not committing adultery when they fool around with the world. The believers committing adultery on Christ when they stop giving him their attention and their affection, and they start giving that to the world. Now, Pastor, how do we draw the line there? The same way, that's why we, he, God used the term adulterers and adulteresses, because we can understand this. Now, if I'm talking to Carla after church, my wife doesn't have a problem with that. I'm Carla's pastor. Carla has a question for me. I'm answering her question. That's part of it. Well, you're not thinking about your wife the whole time, so no, no. We, we understand how this works, right? We understand. But if I start giving away my affection to somebody who's not my wife, if I start giving away my attention, if they start becoming important in my life so that I'm taking away from what is rightfully, what rightfully belongs to my wife, now even though I may not have committed adultery in physical form, I'm committing a form of adultery, and I'm stealing what is my wife's and giving it to another person. And that can happen on a chat room as well as it can happen in a hotel room. Because Jesus defined adultery by the lust, not by the action. It's by the desire, not by the action. That's how he defines it. And James, when he's making this comparison, is saying, yeah, you have to go into the world and work and conduct business and go grocery shopping and do all those kind of things. So that's not a problem. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about going clothes shopping and getting nice clothes. If you can afford nice clothes, go get nice clothes. If you have to go to the Goodwill and get your clothes, go to the Goodwill and get your clothes. You know, I, well, I want to look nice. Nothing wrong with that. But when you say, I want the world to think I look nice, I want to impress the world, not Jesus. I'm an adulterer. Just like I would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to wear this suit because uh, this other lady at church will think I'm going to look really handsome, and I'm not saying, boy, I think my wife will think I'm handsome. Would you all agree it would be wrong for me to be worried about what a trying to impress another woman in the church. That's wrong. Because she's the only opinion that should matter to me. Jesus is the only opinion that should matter to the believers. Well, I won't, I won't be cool. Jesus wasn't cool. And the attempts by the uh, the He Gets Us campaign to try and make Jesus sound cool, They're, they don't have the Jesus of the Bible. They're trying to invent a Jesus that's cool and appealing to the world. Jesus was never cool and appearing, appealing to the world except when he was doing magic tricks. I'm using a from a worldly perspective. I want to see the magic show. I want to see the signs. 
But when he started preaching hard and he stopped doing the miracles, you know what they did? They all left. To the point that Jesus looked at his disciples and said, are you going to? Where would we go? You have the words of life. Well, at least somebody gets it. Eleven of the twelve got it. Not even all twelve of his disciples got it. Let me ask you something. You may say, well, pastor, I'm not, I'm not a real lustful person. I don't think of myself that way. Well, let me ask you something. How much do you care about what's happening in the world and, and what the world thinks about you and how you live your life? If the answer is anything other than not at all, then there's a problem. There's a lot of churches that really care what the world thinks of their church, and so they tailor the message and they tailor the music and they tailor everything to think to make us attractive to the world. Now, we're getting ready to spend a lot of money on our building, and we want our building to look nice, and we want it to be attractive, and when people come in, we want them to say, wow, this looks really nice. These people are serious. These people uh, know how to take care of things. These, we, we want to do that, but we're not... My first and foremost thought is not, boy, if, if we can just get the world to like us, then we'd do so much better. They're never going to like us. They can come in. They like the building. We could change the music, and we could have a bunch of, you know, hopping around here, you know, head banging, whatever people are doing these days, you know, have the lights flashing and fog machine or whatever, and everyone go, wow. And we could, we could like, I don't understand why churches actually contract bands to perform in their church for a year, you know. It's like, we're going we're gonna to sign a new worship team this year. I don't get that, but okay, let's say we signed the best worship team in all of, all of Christianity, and they came up here, and you were like blown away by the quality of music up here. And the world just came flocking to hear the best Christian worship team that there is. When I get up and say, thus saith the Lord, 90% of those people are going to get up and never come back. You know why? Because they didn't come here for that. You see, when it gets down to the word, that's when it's over. By the way, we're not supposed to get lost people to church. We're supposed to go to the lost people, win them to Christ, and then bring the saved people to the church. Hello? You will not find anywhere where God says, you know, it's really important to get the lost people into church. Now, if you can get lost people in here, you know I'll preach the gospel to them. But I'll tell you what. If you win them to Christ at Red Lobster or at Starbucks and then you bring that saved person to church, they're going to like it more than they would have when they were lost. So I'm not saying don't bring lost people to church. Please invite your lost friends to church so they can hear the gospel. But we're not here to impress the lost. Friendship with the world is enmity. or It's open hostility. It's warfare with God. Whosoever, therefore, be a friend of the world is the what? Enemy of God. Now, you'll never be anything but a child of God if you're saved. What he's talking about there is putting yourself in a position where you're on the wrong side. You're like Lot living in Sodom. God didn't destroy Lot with Sodom. God delivered Lot because Lot was righteous, the Bible says. Just Lot vexed his righteous soul. Lot was the Old Testament equivalent of a saved man, but he was living in the most wicked city that ever existed. So much so that Abraham got God all the way down to 10. If there's just 10, will you not destroy it? God said, I won't destroy it if there's 10 righteous people in Sodom. There was Lot, his wife. He had two daughters living at home, and then he had other children living in there with their children in Sodom, and even among his own family, you couldn't get 10. But God, because he never breaks his promises, delivered Lot, and then he destroyed Sodom. But how many of you want to be Lot when you stand before the Lord? Oh, you'll be delivered. God's going to take you out of here and take you to heaven regardless of how lousy of a Christian you actually are. He's still going to take you to heaven because he never breaks his promise. But how many of you want to be there on judgment day and be that person that committed adultery on him? 
spiritually here in this earth. You want to put yourself in there? Be very careful you don't let the world and what the world thinks is cool and what the world wants, that it doesn't begin to drive you and motivate you and cause you to make decisions that are contrary to the Word of God. If you're saved here tonight, you will never be cool to the world following Jesus. Just accept that truth. You will never be cool. Say it to yourself as many times as you need in the mirror. I will never be cool to the world if I'm following Jesus. And once you accept that fact, it's much easier to follow Jesus. If I decide to align myself with the world, I'm lining up against the Lord. And I don't want to face the Lord in battle. I'd much rather be with the Lord on his side in the battle. We'll quit there tonight. We're gonna, it's going to get deeper and deeper when we get into the rest of this chapter. But let's stand together for a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful that um, we have this portion of Scripture to really show us